any new fabrication process and architecture comes expectation. Polaris from AMD, like Nvidia's latest Pascal cards, has launched them both headfirst into FinFET manufacturing. This brings with it huge power TDP and size gains that can deliver vastly increased performance and reduce cost. The choice does not always have to be so black and white though, and with its spearhead product in the RX 480, has Team Red created a new king of mass market graphics. To start on the obvious area that some may latch onto or be disappointed with, as I stated with my announcement video, this card is not aimed at or even in the same market as the 1070-1080 cards. Now, these are at least twice the price or higher, and this is the market that Vega will target when launched later this year or early next. Now, Polaris is all about the TAM, Total Addressable Market, and it aims to lower the entry point for mid to high-end graphics and the full VR experience all for under $200 or pounds. If we take the Steam hardware survey, it is up against the single most popular discrete GPU, Nvidia's GTX 970, but that is not the user base it has its sights on, but the much bigger and more lucrative market below. Taking only the next five most popular GPUs after this, and AMD have a target of GTX 960s, 750Ti's, 760s for discrete cards only, giving them 40% bigger market share to aim for along with their own cards within that band. The next three built-in options on CPU pushes to over 100% and are all a base price that is just under 100 or so dollars less of Team Green's runaway seller. Now the target is clear for the card. Can it equal or edge the 970 from Nvidia and deliver a sizable leap over the competition from the 750, R270, R380 cards? Well, let's find out. <laughs> It is a functional piece that looks and feels sturdy enough with its stylized Radeon logo and almost carbon fiber like casing complete with its six pin power connector. Measuring just 12 centimeters long it will fit into most gaming towers with ease but if you have an MTX case and such like it could be slightly tighter and say the 750Ti. Now once clipped in and hooked up acoustics are good with no serious sound issues over any other cards at idle although with its relatively poor blower this is not a surprise. Now temperatures also play a part into the car's level with it sitting at the desktop happily at 36 degrees all day long, within my office anyway, and under full steam ahead hitting heights of 81C. Now on standard clocks with a small overclock on the RAM to 8 gigabits to match the 8 gig model. This being a 4 gig model here to give the best comparison to the GTX 970. This is a 180 pound card versus a 250 pound one currently at 512 meg extra is also a game changer. Oh. Now rumors abound that all cards at launch from 4 gigabytes to 8 gigabytes are in fact 8 gigabytes. And I can tell you that's true. Yes, this is not really that uncommon in a production situation and Polaris has had other rumors pointing to production issues. But I have bought both a 4 gig and 8 gig card for testing from the same supplier, the always top draw Sapphire cards. Now, although I wanted to test them both with a flash of the BIOS, at present the tool does not support the card. Once it has been updated, though, I will confirm the flash works. The physical modules on the card, though, are identical. You can read more information about all of this and the card itself, including its power draw shenanigans on our site that goes into more detail on the cards and my tests. You can also see full comparison videos for the cards against the 970, the 750Ti, the R380 and R270 in the linked videos on screen and in the description below and also the site. More will be added at 1080 and 1440 as I complete them shortly. So that's the contents, what about the spec? Well, this 4 gig card runs the memory at 7 gigabits rather than the 8 gigabits that the 8 gig card runs. You can overclock this though like I have here by 250 megahertz to deliver the same rate. And aside this change, the rest of the specs are identical, giving us a core clock of 1120 megahertz with a boost of 1266, 2,304 stream processors within the 36 compute units have access to a 256-bit bus allowing 224 gigabytes on the 4 gig cards and surprisingly the same speed as the rumored Neo specs as I predicted months ago and 256 gigabytes on the 8 gig card or the overclock ones as just mentioned here. Now bending with 5.1 teraflops in a TDP of 150 watt which comes from the PCIe port and the card 6 pin adapter. 
Now idle on desktops, it uses around 10 to 20 watts, and maxed out under multiple games tested, it hits a peak of 123.7 watts, but this increases with the extra 4 gig modules used and encroaches its maximum TDP. Now aside the memory clock, I left all other portions at stock for now, and I will cover the new Wattman application in another video, but the app is simple and similar to other cars tools. Now it's all about the games after this and with its real rival the GTX 970 here I'm using my MSI Froza partner board that has an overclock to the core at 1350 MHz and memory at 1752 and maxed out at 120 watt under full load which is still very impressive for a 28 nanometer card against this newer 14 nanometer board. Now once the better cooled and boosted cards launch in the next few weeks I will review my choice and see how things change but for this standard boards I would not and I never do really recommend much of an overclock due to the stock fans not being sufficient. Now how close does it get to matching the £250 card here being 28% cheaper yet in two games it runs neck and neck with the green card and right within margin of error. The PC Black Sheep of Batman Arkham Knights both hit a pretty solid 60 on both aside the driving sections meaning that the RX 480 is 0.12% behind the 970 which pretty much means identical. Forza Apex is the same and even though a DX12 title like another we cover it also falls 0.03% up to the GTX card and again means at this point we are running identical for each and that cost saving with extra future options with its single HDMI port, triple display 1.3, 1.4 ports along with H.265 streaming and HEVC encoding is already a very good value but will this continue? Well, Rise of the Tomb Raider again comes close but the 970 edges out with a 3.4% advantage to the tune of 2 FPS higher average but aside this test you would call them neck and neck. Now Doom highlights best that the driver here version 16.62 still needs some work as it can stutter at points causing unwelcome and mostly unrequired dips below the 60 cap at 1080 and without these it would again be a dead heat across both cards. You may notice that most of my tests here are from actual gameplay as this is by far a more accurate means of testing than many others as it presents the results you actually get in play far more accurately. These are also well processed using my frame analysis tools with FCAT where needed and the detailed results are presented here. Now we only start to see bigger gaps as we move into game work link titles so The Witcher 3 minus any hair works of course on both as it just steals too much performance but everything else maxed out we see the biggest gap yet in Nvidia's favour 7.7% and a 4 FPS average gap. Again these driver issues present themselves not helped by the black box editions. Both Unity and Syndicate indicate even bigger gaps and some of this will stem from the tougher time the CPU still has with the Crimson driver than the Nvidia one. Unity is by far the worst as it uses far more CPU time than Syndicate having reduced geometry calls and AI animation etc with Unity giving it the biggest gap so far of 38% over the RX 480. Syndicate has a much more modest 9% gap and is much closer but pushes the gap between the two cards to its biggest yet. But help is at hand with a big DX12 title and one that also had a troubled launch in Quantum Break. Now we see the roles reversed and the RX 480 commands its own 36% leap over Nvidia. On ultra settings at 1080 the GTX 970 struggles to hit 30 and dips to a low of 8. It even crashed a few times and this like all games tested are with the latest Nvidia driver. Now GTA 5 saves face for the 970 with again a 7% gain and a 4 FPS advantage ending the test with the 970 being the overall winner. With DX11 titles and Gameworks it can command a 40% lead which is skewed heavily by Unity and The Witcher 3. But DX12 sees the opposite and the RX 480 gains 36% and this leaves the stock card performing behind the MSI card here. I really feel that driver updates will claw much of this back and on this 4 gig reference card and the aftermarket cards to really push this on at obviously higher cost but a much bigger performance metric. Now unsurprisingly this means that if you have a GTX 970 then the RX 480 makes absolutely no sense at all. Even if it's an 8 gig model is really worth the move or not. It only really comes down to the fact that if you can sell your card and pocket the difference. But that just isn't very likely at all. But this was always going to be the case. And the same stands for the R390 or R390X owners. As this card will deliver slightly better or worse levels than what you currently have. Less so on the 390X. 
But if you have a 750 Ti, R270, 380, 950, 960 or lower, then this card is a good value. As expected, giving you a card that can run pretty much all modern titles at max 1080, 60 and with sacrifices a decent lick at 1440. Throwing the cheapest VR card capable on the market, it will certainly address that TAM that AMD touted so much. So after all that, I should be impressed, and in some ways I am, but ultimately not by much, as it is a shame that in its standard form it feels shackled and struggles to overclock much at all. The power use, even though better than previous cards, is not as impressive as it should be, and far from Nvidia's rival's latest card. Yes, some of this may be down to the chosen factory of origin, but Vega has a big hill to climb with Pascal, and power consumption, driver support, along with onboard resource, are going to need to step up the game. My expectations are duly tempered from what has been launched here, but I really believe that Vega will deliver something special, and the aftermarket cards to launch will probably show us really what Polaris can deliver. As it stands, this is the best medium to high-end card you can buy right now, and if you can pick up a launch 4 gig card with a video flash to 8 gig, then it really leaves all other cards trembling with an 8 gigabyte VRAM allocation at stupid money. That said, I feel it best to wait for the next bout of cards from MSI, Gigabyte, XFX and Sapphire to truly unlock the potential in Polaris 10. And I think when that happens, the shackles are going to come off and it may yet achieve far more than we've seen from this original launch. Now please check out the full comparison runs of the cards below and read the full article on my site. Leave all your thoughts and feedback below. I'm sorry this review took a little longer to get up, but I do have a full-time job. This is only something I do on the side. And yet again, I did not get my review card. So unfortunately, I had to buy all my cards still. And that obviously delayed the time for me getting hands-on. Anyway, I hope you guys and girls enjoyed this and I hope you found it useful. Please leave a like and subscribe to really support the channel. Play fast, play hard, and I'll see you on the next one.